Almighty God, who graciously we pray on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners, and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you at the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 13, to chapter 53, verse 12. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they have not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 10, beginning at verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord.
Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, hey, King of the Jews. And striking him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I have no case against him. The Jews answered him, Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. 
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his, mother, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that all, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced.
all four gospel writers dedicate a third of each of their books to covering the last week of our Lord's life, what we call Holy Week. This reveals how important this week was and is to the church, as well as the events associated with it. One of the themes that is covered during Holy Week is the abandonment of Jesus by his disciples who ran away in fear. It is true that when the disciples saw their master being bound and led away, they seized the opportunity to escape. But all four gospel writers reveal that the disciples, or at least one of them, did attempt to fight back that Peter and one other disciple followed Jesus as far as to the high priest's palace, and that the disciple who followed Peter, or whom Peter followed, was known to the high priest and actually felt comfortable enough to enter into the palace where Jesus was being tried. There is also the young man, who Mark speaks of, who followed them and then fled naked when the soldiers tried to seize him. If you take these passages into account, clearly not everyone forsook Jesus. The disciples can be forgiven for at least trying to save Jesus or to support him in his moment of trial to some extent. Like many of us, they were prepared to help Jesus within reason. <clears throat> the question I keep asking myself is, were they doing enough to help him? Was it that they were prepared to help only if their action caused no risk to themselves? We have already seen where after the danger had passed, Peter retraced his steps and followed the procession to the palace of the high priest. There in the safety of the darkness and far enough to one side that he not be noticed, he sat. And I can identify with that. As a teenager, that was exactly where I sat in church. Far enough to the side and behind a column so as not to catch the attention of the parson or my peers for what cool and hip youngster wants to be seen going to church. And I should mention that as a young adult, I worshipped here at St. Andrew Parish Church, and my seat was right there behind that column. <clears throat> when Peter is noticed and challenged by the high priest's servant, his courage left him, and he swore that he did not know Jesus. Once more, he found himself sinking, just as when previously on the lake he sank as he took his eyes off the master. Peter was a passionate disciple, deeply devoted to Jesus. He had witnessed miracles, even walked on water, and he confessed Jesus as the Messiah. His self-confidence led him to declare that he would never abandon Jesus, even if others did. But self-confidence can be deceptive. It often overestimates our own strength and underestimates the power of temptation and sin. I would like to suggest that what made Peter fail is his overconfidence in himself. 
But are we any better? Do words such as self-confidence, self-reliance, independence fall easily from our lips? When we were baptized or confirmed, we promised to continue in the apostles' teaching, in fellowship with one another, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. We promised to persevere in resisting evil, to not be silent, to be a witness of Christ every day of our lives. We said we would serve Christ by loving God, but even more so by loving our neighbors and remembering that every person is loved and valued. We promise to put our whole trust in his grace and love. And so I ask myself this new Good Friday, how am I doing with these promises today? What grade would I give myself? Humility involves recognizing our limitations, our weaknesses, and our dependence on God. Do we trust in our own strength, often not heeding the advice of others more experienced or wiser than we are? Do we believe that though others may fail Jesus, we will still remain true? Are we surprised when we fall from grace or someone who is like us falls from grace? Like Peter, we may think that we are immune to certain failures. But humility reminds us of our vulnerability and keeps us dependent on God's grace. That self-confidence without a basis in God is nothing more than vanity. Vanity is an old-time word which has become disused today. Nobody talks about vanity. When we talk about vanity, we're thinking about the furniture and with bedroom. But vanity is really that pride in ourselves, that utter self-confidence in ourselves which is divorced from God. And it was this vanity which led Peter to neglect Jesus' warning. It was this dependence on his own strength that made him sleep instead of spending the time that Jesus had asked him to in the garden praying for strength to meet the ordeal, ordeal to come. And thus it was his own vanity which contributed to his own downfall. I believe Peter and the other disciples loved Jesus but their vanity got in the way. They wanted to walk the walk, but they just couldn't finish it. They wanted to give him their heart, but at the last moment, they could not let go of it. Their love for self was far greater. We, too, love the Lord Jesus. If you did not love him, you would not be in church this Good Friday. It was cold this morning, wasn't it? or listening to this service over the internet. But do we love him enough to walk with him the entire journey to Calvary? Are we willing to lay down our lives for him? Are we faithful communicants one day, and then as the pressures of life overtake us, we find ourselves dropping in less regularly until we finally fail to come at all? Do we serve him only in ways that make us not feel uncomfortable? These are just a few questions we must ask ourselves as we look at Jesus hanging from the cross. I believe that as the cock crowed, and Peter looked at Jesus, and Jesus looked on him. What he saw on Jesus' face melted his heart. 
I do not believe that he saw a look of condemnation or even a look that said, I told you so. I believe he saw a look of forgiveness, a look of understanding, a look of love. The mirror opposite of his own selfishness, weakness, and lack of faith. And I think it is when he saw this that he broke down and cried, for he knew he was unworthy of such love. Jesus doesn't cast us aside. His grace reaches out to us even in our darkest moments. Our brokenness becomes an opportunity for him to transform us. We follow a risen Christ. Yet we still choose to turn away from Jesus when we feel guilty. When we feel that we have disappointed him. The late Peter Marshall once said in a prayer, It is not that we don't know what to do. The truth is, deep down, we just don't want to do it. This is the total opposite to Jesus, who chose to die for us, to endure the shame and the humiliation and the suffering for us. Seeing this and knowing he could not find it in himself to love Jesus with the same sacrificial love which Jesus extended to him, I believe hurt Peter more than anything else. The fact that Jesus was able to give of himself so completely and Peter could not. Thus Jesus found himself alone, totally alone, as he faced his accusers. Not because there was no one around, but because no one would step up. So alone he bore his cross. Alone he hung and died. With all the good intentions that we have, was it or is it enough? The good news is that Jesus was not expecting nor do I believe he wanted Peter or any of his disciples to save him from Calvary. Rather, it is he who had come to save. However grievously we may have denied Christ's name and betrayed his cause, even when our paltry attempts to serve him fail and fall short, yet his love and forgiveness pleads to us to return to him. Peter would in time learn that Jesus was willing to forgive and to entrust his ministry to him. Peter, Jesus says, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter would learn to make a total surrender to Jesus. In time, Jesus would transform Peter into the man that Jesus saw deep within him. He would hold up his greatest moment of weakness, that is Peter, would hold up his greatest moment of weakness as a sign and a symbol to us that though, though we may fail Jesus at times in our lives, there is always the opportunity to return. Peter would face the future with humility, yet with a certain confidence of those who know both their own weakness and the almighty power of their savior to save. And who hears his gracious voice echoing across the ages, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Amen. Let us pray. Give us your grace, Father, in this moment 
as we contemplate your passion. As we reflect upon what you have done for us through your great love and how often we have failed you. But give us the light, Father, of your transforming power that we will not take our failures a measure of our worth, but humbly turning to you, leaning upon you, that we may rise to become more of your disciples as you have, would want us to be. And so guide us, Lord, that this Good Friday, we will reflect upon our need for humility and our need to put our trust in you and you alone. All this we ask through Christ our Savior. Amen.
dear people of God. Our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers, and the people whom they serve, for Howard our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, particularly for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for our government. For Governor Patrick, our Governor General, Andrew, Prime Minister, Mark, Leader of the Parliamentary Opposition, members of Cabinet, all members of Parliament, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle we pray in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice for the sick, the wounded, the physically challenged and the disabled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish. For those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, for those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer. Hear the cry of those in misery and need. In their afflictions, show them your mercy, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. 
for all who have not heard the saving gospel of Christ, for all who have lost their faith, for all whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you, as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it, and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all places of education and learning. Let us pray for all engaged in promoting and fostering education in schools, colleges, and universities, that all who teach in them may be endowed with knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and may seek to be guided in all their acts, that students may accept with gratitude and humility the opportunities to use God's gifts of mind and intellect, that the spirit of truth may enlighten their learning, enlarge their understanding, and inspire their growth in mature judgment. Almighty God, you are the source of truth and your spirit leads us into the truth. May all who teach and all who learn in our schools, colleges, and universities be set free from everything that is false or evil. And finding truth, may they learn to use it for the good of humankind and for your greater glory. Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ and whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of joy, our Lord, and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorable on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are now being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen.
At this time, we will kneel This is the wood of the cross for which hung the Savior of the world.
Is it nothing to you all who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of this fierce anger. church what have I done to you or in what have I offended you testify against me I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism but you have prepared a cross for your Savior desert for 40 years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys to the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. My peace I gave which the world cannot give, and washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you drew this sword to strike in my name, and to seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. I 
have sent the spirit of truth to guide you and you close your heart to the counselor. I pray that all may be as one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. I have shown you the healing power of my love and compassion to raise up and comfort the afflicted, but you have willingly inflicted punishment and suffering upon your fellow human for evil gain. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And them four. O Savior of the world, by your cross and precious blood, you have redeemed us. My brothers and sisters, we invite you to come forward and to venerate the cross in whichever way you desire.
numbered 147, when I survey the wondrous cross. taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Let us pray. Bow down before the Lord. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon, bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. 